great warlord Tokugawa Ieyasu, founder of the shogunate that ruled Japan from the 17th century until 1868, was deified upon his death. His spirit, Tosho Daigogen, became the country's official guardian, and the Toshobu Shrine at Mount Kuno, Shizuoka in Japan, was dedicated to his sacred memory. The sanctuary houses his personal items, which reflect their master's status, taste, and relationships. Some represent diplomatic gifts from an era in which Spain, Portugal, England, and Holland all coveted Japan in a race for economic dominion in the Pacific. Among the marvelous collections in the main treasury hall, there stands a western tablecloth. Framed in, a brass and, uh, framed in brass and mounted with a large bell, its inscription declares, Hans de Valo me fekit, Hans de Valo made me, Madrid, 1581. The clock also boasts images. Perspectival arcades engraved upon its armature open up to an imaginary landscape. Speaking for itself, the object declares its status as a work of art, inscribed by its author in a single time and place. Yet referencing both real and imaginary locations, this puzzling contraption also inaugurates its own narrative of mobility. Offered by an embassy organized by the Viceroy of Mexico on the behalf of the Spanish crown, the ceremony took place at Yeyasu's castle in Shizuoka in 1611, where Spanish diplomat Sebastián Vizcaino attempted to improve the country's increasingly contentious relationship. Yeyasu had become suspicious of the Christian mission in Japan, set up by the Jesuits in the 1540s and supported by the Spanish monarchy. This was a moment of fraught political tension. However, I argue that the clock pertains to a larger culture of exchange between the two nations. While objects' speed of travel increased during the 17th century, their movements exceed the context of emerging global trade networks. Crucially, image and technology inform one another in this case. The clock served as a platform for, ne for negotiation wherein the aesthetics of political dissimulation played a key role. Transit conditions instability, where successive material transfers perpetually deconstruct and reconstruct the artwork. Borrowing from Alessandra Rousseau's work on the untranslatable image, I suggest encounter occurs within the material itself as an assemblage of visual fragments from near and far. The clock posits multiple identities. Renaissance and Baroque table clocks were prized possessions made for a cultural elite and desirable courtly gifts. Flemish Hans de Avalo originated from Brussels and had been King Philip II of Spain's official clockmaker. His art was one of intricate embellishment. Indeed, mechanical precision yielded more than just functional timepieces. It served as a vehicle of creative expression, equivalent to the other liberal arts of the time. Due to its metal medium, clockwork was often related to engraving, and many Flemish clocks adapted models from contemporaneous printers. As art historian Christopher Wood has shown, perspective prints were frequently used to purposes of portable objects in this period. Not just a representation of illusionistic space, perspective functioned ornamentally, inviting uh, attention to the <coughs> clock's door, which conceals and reveals its machinery. Perspective itself can be thought as a mechanism or an optical instrument which plays with material surfaces through geometrical construction. Automatic machinery could thus model dissimulation. The clock's inner workings evaded immediate sight behind enigmatic surfaces. Mechanical secrecy emulated a, metho a method of Baroque knowledge making which depended on interaction and imagination to reveal the true nature of artifice. The concept of the machine is problematic as the term was quite variously applied during the late 16th and 17th centuries. For example, Philip II's palace, the Escorial, was often referred to as a marvelous machine in the sense of construction, because this multipartite and labyrinthine structure defied singular interpretation and seemed locked in a state of perpetual hermeneutic motion. Walter Benjamin had already recognized the analogy between machine and court in his analysis of German Baroque drama. The clock's emblematic status and self-sufficiency related to the courtier's ability to mask his true intentions for political, political gain. In 17th century um, diplomat Diego de Savarda Fallardo's emblem book on the Christian prince's politic, the image of the monarch merged with the table clock under the motto, uni redatur, all can be reduced to one. The accompanying text affirms, quote, as the wheels of the clock carry on in silence and without sight, and yet all artifice depends of them. 
In the clockwork of government, the prince should not be only a hand, but also the escapement that tells all the other wheels the time to move." End quote. Here, the hidden mechanical device provides the prototype for the courtly body and manner. The, anal the, anal the analogy recurs in many contemporaneous Spanish portraits, such as this one by Alonso Sanchez Coelho, featuring a courtier beside a clock, referencing an actual Hans de Avalo model made in the 1580s. We are dealing here with an aesthetic of precision, where the nobleman's mechanics of self-presentation, his pose and attire, are as elegant and precisely calibrated as his clockwork counterparts. And just to you know, add on, he, the, the dresses they were wearing at the time were extremely stiff, so you also have to sort of program your gestures in that way. You, there's a whole kind of way of moving within these dresses because they're so kind of layered and, and stiff. So there's also something mechanical and precise about even the way you present yourself uh, when you're moving around. Viscaino modeled this courtly decorum in his gift to the shogun and presented the clock along with a set of portraits of the Spanish king and queen. The clock's 30-year transit from Spain through Mexico and the Pacific emphasize a desire for empire, where multiple geographically distant locations could seem unified under a shared machinery of time. However, while the object indexed its place of origin as a proxy for the absent monarch's body, it moved through a constant change of ambassadorial hands, which formed less of a centralized administration than a dense and tangled network of cultures and territories, which composed the Spanish Empire. The clock's movement through time and space already represented a shift in meaning, as well as a fragment of Spain's expansionist dream. It was built at the height of Philip II's power, just as he gained access to the Portuguese throne and its overseas territories, consolidating the Iberian Union. Thirty years later, his descendant Philip III had already suffered defeat against the English and the waning of Iberian power in the Pacific. Even before its arrival to Japan, Hans de Avalo's clock already seemed to belong to another time and place. Viscano's gift had not been the first clock to reach Japan, however. Rather, it was rooted in the Jesuits' long-standing tradition of presenting automatic machinery to East Asian rulers. For Jesuit missionaries, the gifting of scientific instruments, such as clocks, telescopes, and maps, followed a practice they termed propagatio fidei versientas, the propagation of faith through science. For Jesuits, images and objects served as effective devices for inspiring faith as they were said to reveal the secrets of divine creation through these mechanics of dissimulations. Clocks were characterized as microcosms of the Christian universe. In Japan, the Jesuits also established workshops to produce paintings and clocks destined for a Japanese elite. <clears throat> An early 17th century folding screen, produced in such a workshop from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, interweaves the different dynamics that I have argued occur between clock and image. A king and his court appear in an, architect, an archi, sorry, architectural space across its surface. On each of the six gold ground panels, figures stand before a dark passage surrounded by decorated columns. On the fifth leaf from the right, a nobleman grasping his gloves gazes out, outward beside a clock hanging from the column. The image echoes Coelho's portrait of the courtier and clock relocated to a new medium and place. The screen is one of the few examples of collaboration between Jesuit, Jesuits and local artists that synthesized imported European printed models with Japanese painting techniques. In the screen, the clock lays open, displaying its interior gears for the viewer to peer into. Figures stand behind each other, staring into different parts of the architecture, only sometimes intersecting with the viewer's gaze. A soldier steps out of the shadows, while lifting a suspended curtain. Holding his baton, the courtier looks into, out into an opening, yet the object of his view remains hidden. These are the dynamics of courtly dissimulation, a strange commentary on the theatrics of looking for a cultural elite. The Boston screen becomes a reflection on sight and image in, which, in ways that transgress particular cultural norms. It represents a reassemblage of the distant and the local, a fantastical western palatial interior as imagined by European citizens abroad, remediated onto a Japanese format with their native collaborators. Through its transit into Yasu's possession, the Avalo clock produced the same reflection on locality as the Boston screen. The clock's engraved view yielded a landscape exotic to a Japanese audience. 
The dial, which interfaced between viewer and machine and translated time's passing into an intelligible diagram, now appeared as a distinctively foreign structure, one less immediately accessible in a Japanese context. Many Jesuit letters recounted how some Japanese warlords dismissed their gifted clocks as useless novelties, viewing them as nothing more than mere entertainment. Contemporaneous Japanese records on the 1611 Spanish embassy described the clock as a self-sounding bell, a term also used in China to describe European gifted clocks. Emphasizing the object's ability to produce sound rather than its visual characteristics, the term describes less a timepiece than, a, than, an, uh, sorry, sorry, than an automaton that was given a voice. As the clock achieved enshrinement at Mount Kunodan after Ieyasu's death in 1616, it joined the immense array of objects in his dedicated temples. Art historian Morgan Patelka has described this collection as an empire of things, where Ieyasu's personal possessions became ritual objects for his perpetual commemoration as a divine ancestor. According to Tokugawa ideology and propaganda, the clock stood as a belonging of the dead, a testament to Ieyasu's diplomatic abilities, and a vessel for his deified spirit. It symbolized Ieyasu's passage from a worldly ruler into a mortal protective spirit of Japan. Clockmaking, however, continued in the Japanese cultural sphere. Local craftsmen appropriated fragments left by the Algerian exchange after the Jesuits' banishment in 1540. In the early 17th century, craftsmen working for the Tokugawa began adapting clocks to the Japanese temporal system. Since Japanese hours were longer than the ones in the West, artisans moved uh, the folio to the clock's exterior frame, moving the weights outward to slow the clock's motion. And here we have an example of a double folio clock. So those are the two structures that you can see uh, right underneath the bell. And what they do basically is they permit you to or uh, slow down or accelerate the mechanism of the interior clock. And it was moved from the inside of the clock from its, its exterior. And this is typical of Japanese clocks from the late 17th and 18th century. The dial was fitted with movable digits for seasonal change and consisted of an outer circle with the Japanese temporal system of 12 animal symbols and an inner one with their numerical equivalents. 18th century chronicler Arai Hakuseki ident identified Ivalo's clock as the model for his own country's timepieces. Whether this is truth or fantasy, Japanese clocks of the 18th century remain, retain the shape of their European models with modified dials. However, rather than dealing with theoretical concepts of time, Modifications occurred at a material level as Japanese artisans came into contact with the foreign clock and toyed with its mechanism. A similar machine, but time now wore a different face. Such machi machines reveal the tenuous roots of visual and material transmission. The development of clockwork in Japan's 18th century indeed opens up to another story altogether. Evalo's clock stands less as a stable prototype than a fragment of complex exchange in an era before globalization. It represented a desire for a unity of time in an uncertain period, where cultural encounter stressed an ever-expanding plurality of chronologies. The artwork's temporal and geographic inscription, Mifekit Madrid 1581, strives to secure a historical certitude, while its object embarks on a mobile itinerary. What I have stressed here is the, con the contingency of transfer. Objects of this time often followed unexpected routes, and their arrivals could not always be predetermined. Curiosity, wonder, secrecy, and dissimulation remained in these encounters of limited communication, and where the image was not always necessarily intelligible. It is within these very time spaces of exchange, inherent in the material vestiges of objects in motion, that meaning can be manifold. of objects exchanged. As they traverse ge geographies and temporalities, they transgress the boundaries of even that which they claim to regulate or enforce. Persisting in time and space, such material objects are the artifacts of the unstable. Thank you very much.